A combination is the number of ways that we can group a certain number of objects. If we think about the letters A, B, C, so we have three different objects, if we're dealing with permutations, we are arranging those objects. So we have to figure out how many arrangements can we create using those three letters. So we could put the A first, the B first, or the C first. Then if we put B second, we can also put B third, keeping A first in that arrangement. So we can see that if we take three objects, there are six different permutations mutations that we can create from those three letters. In terms of combinations, there is only one combination. There is one way that we can group those three letters together. So the order does not matter. We take a group of those three letters. One group is all we can create. So with a permutation, your keyword is arrangement. How many ways can we arrange the objects? With a combination, your keyword is group. How many ways can we choose a group of however many objects we happen to be dealing with? And you're going to notice that we always have more permutations than we do combinations for a given amount of objects. Let's say that we have five objects and we want to determine the number of possible combinations we can have using two shapes at a time. So I'm going to begin by drawing out my possible combinations and I'm going to go in some kind of an order so I can keep track of what I have and what I don't have. So for example, I can put the triangle with the star, that's one group. I do not need to then put the star with the triangle, that's in a different arrangement but it's not a different group. So I'm going to group those two together. I can then go triangle with the oval, triangle with the heart, triangle with the check mark, and we can get four different groups that way. I'm then going to take my star. I've already grouped it with the triangle, so it's not going to go with the triangle again, but I can put the star with the oval and then with the heart and then with the check mark, and I can create three more groups. I can then take the oval and put it with the heart and the check mark, and I can get two more groups. And then I can put the heart with the check mark and get a last group. I'm then going to take a look. Are there any objects that did not go with another object? If so, I forgot one and I need to add it. But if I take a look and go through, I think now every shape is grouped up with every other shape. I'm able to create 10 groups of two from five objects. Using these same five objects, let's take a look now at how many groups we're able to create using three objects at a time. And again, I'm going to use some kind of orderly process just to make sure I don't miss anything. So I'm going to begin by putting these three together and then these two with the heart, these two with the check mark, and so on. Take a look, are there any three objects that are not together in a group? I think I've got them all. And you can see again that there are 10 different groups we can create from those five objects using three of those objects at a time. Is there a faster way to go about this instead of drawing out the number of groups that we can have? Yes, there is. So in our first example, we had five objects and we were choosing groups of two. Mathematically, what we can do is start with five factorial. We know that factorial is how many objects we can put into our first position, then how many can go into the next position, and then the next position, and so on going down to that three, two, one. So this implies that we are ordering all five objects. It's going to arrange everything that we're using. However, we are not arranging them. So we're going to begin by saying, okay, there's five objects, but we're only choosing two at a time. So that means at any given time, we are not using three objects. So we're going to divide out the three objects that we are not using. We're then going to divide out the number of arrangements we get when we have two objects at a time. So we're dividing out the ones we're not using. We are unarranging the two objects that we are using. And you can try putting this in your calculator. Remember, you have to bracket the denominator and you're going to see that we get a value of 10. And then in the second example, we're still using five objects, but this time we're choosing groups of three. So we can begin by ordering all five of those objects, divide out the two that we are not using if we're taking a group of three, and then we're going to unarrange the three that we are using. And again, when you put this in your calculator, you need to bracket that denominator, and you're going to see that gives us a value of 10. 3 factorial times 2 factorial is the same value as 2 factorial times 3 factorial. So when we take the product of this, we're going to get the same value. When we divide 5 factorial by this value in the denominator, we can see that we get the same number of groups each time. N represents the number of objects we have available. 
R is how many we're putting into each group. So to determine the number of combinations or groups possible, we're first going to arrange all of the objects. We're then going to remove those objects that we are not using. We're going to unarrange the objects that we are using. So you can see that the order in which we multiply these two doesn't matter. We're going to get the same value. So we're going to arrange everything, divide out what we're not using, unarrange what we are using, and you just have to remember to put that denominator in brackets. That tells your calculator we're going to be dividing by this entire product. For example, if we take the letters in the word coterminal and we can count there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten letters, Using seven letters at a time, we're going to determine, first of all, the number of permutations possible. So you need to know permutations is the number of arrangements possible. We can determine that by taking all 10 objects and arranging them, divide out three that we are not using, and we're going to end up with 604,800 different arrangements if we have 10 objects and we are arranging seven at a time. If we are determining the number of combinations possible, given those 10 letters in coterminal, you have to know combinations means groups. So this time we're gonna take all 10 letters and arrange them. We're still gonna divide out the three we're not using, but we're now going to unarrange the seven we are using. You're going to remember to put the denominator in brackets when you put it in your calculator, and please try entering this in your calculator to make sure that you're able to do so. And you can see that we're going to have 120 different combinations. Always there will be less combinations than there are permutations. Now you may be thinking, it's a lot of work in your calculator to always be going over to that factorial button. Is there a faster way of doing this? And yes, there is. So just like we had a permutation notation, NPR, we also have a combination notation, NCR. So N represents the number of objects that we have to choose from. R represents the number of them that we are putting into each group. So when you see N choose R, we read it, N choose R, that means arrange everything, divide out what we're not using, unarrange what we are using. And there's actually a second notation for combinations. So if you ever see something like this, so N over R with the round brackets around it, you have to know this also means combinations. Still using our 10 letters in coterminal, if we're determining the number of combinations, so combinations we're determining number of groups if we're choosing groups of four. So we can start by saying, okay, 10 choose four. We know that means that we're going to arrange all 10 objects, we're going to divide out the ones we're not using, we're going to unarrange the ones we are using, and we're going to end up with 210. If we're going to now make groups of six or choose groups of six, that would be 10 objects to choose from. We are choosing groups of six. So again, when we put this into our calculator, our calculator is calculating as though we are arranging all 10 objects, we are removing, dividing out the ones we're not using, unarranging those we are using, and again, we're going to end up with 210. You can see that 10 choose four has the same value of 10 choose six because four plus six is equal to 10. So in each of these cases, we are not using six objects, we are unarranging four. We are not using four objects, we are unarranging six. So those two notations are equivalent in value. And the way that we would enter this into the calculator is very similar to the way that we would enter permutations. So we would start with 10, we would go into the math menu, and then I would left arrow over to get to probability, and we can see number three is going to be that combination notation. So we're gonna choose that one and then four. So 10 choose four, 210. And then again, for the second one here, we're going to have 10. We're gonna go into the math menu, left arrow over to probability, combinations, that's number three, and then we have six objects. So 210, same value. Now that we have an understanding as to how combination notation works, we're going to actually apply it to some examples with conditions. So similar to permutations, we have to address those conditions first. And with combinations, this piece of advice is worth gold. You're going to write out what are the scenarios to fit that condition before performing the calculations. And we'll take a look at what I mean by that in a second here. We're going to begin with playing cards. We know there are 52 cards in a standard deck of playing cards. 
cards. This diagram of all of the cards can be found on page 70 in your textbook, but we can see they are arranged into four suits. So diamonds and hearts are the red cards, clubs and spades are the black cards. We have face cards, jack, queen, and king. There are 13 cards in each suit. So we go from the ace, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. So we have 10 number cards. We have three face cards. There's four suits, 52 cards per deck. And we can see that if there are three face cards per each suit, we have 12 face cards within a deck. Let's begin with if there is no condition. So there are 52 cards in a standard deck. We are choosing any five cards and there are 2,598,960 possible five card hands that we could end up with. In the next question, we are given a condition. So our hand with five cards in it has to contain exactly three red cards. So I want you to picture the deck of cards and you tell me what's in your hand if you have exactly three red cards. And hopefully you notice that in order to get exactly three red cards, you also have to have two black cards. So what we mean by write out all possible scenarios first is we actually wanna take a minute here to write down we need three red cards and we need two black cards. Remember, and in math means multiplication. Once we have this simple statement written down, now it becomes very easy to put the numbers in. So how many red cards do we have in a deck? Well, half the deck is red, half the deck is black. So there are 26 red cards to choose from. We are choosing three and there are 26 black cards to choose from. We are choosing two. Enter this into your calculator and check to make sure you can get the right value. Our next hand of five cards contains no jacks. Well, there are four jacks in a deck. So if we take our 52 cards in a deck, remove those four jacks, that means we're going to have 48 cards left that are not a jack. We are choosing a group of five. We're going to end up with this many possible different hands. If we contain exactly two kings, again, this is a condition. So we're going to write out, if we have exactly two kings, we also have three cards that are not a king. So we know that there are four kings within a deck and we're choosing two. And if we take off those four kings in a deck, 48 cards in a deck are not a king and we are choosing three. And again, enter this into your calculator. Also make sure these two numbers, N and R, are subscript. So they should be written kind of like this one. If this is the line on your loose leaf, they need to be written below that line. In our next question here, our five card hand contains three or more sevens. So that means we can have either three sevens, this is just my handwritten S for seven, or we can have four sevens. We cannot have a hand with five sevens because there are not five sevens in a deck. So we have, if we have three sevens in our hand, we also have two cards that are not a seven. If we have four sevens in our hand, we also have one that is not a seven. So we're gonna have three sevens and two cards that are not a seven, or four sevens and one card that is not a seven. So we know in mathematics, or means addition, and means multiplication. There are four sevens in a deck, we're choosing three, and there are 48 cards in a deck that are not a seven, we are choosing two. Four cards in a deck that are a seven, we're choosing all four. So there's one way that we can choose a group of all of the sevens, and there are 48 cards in a deck that are not a seven, we are choosing one of them. So you can see that this number here indicates how many we are choosing, and that first number N represents how many we have in a deck to choose from that fits that description. Now notice that for all of these card questions, we are using combinations. If we are choosing a group of cards, it doesn't matter the order in which we arrange them into our hand, unless the question specifically says you have to arrange them a certain way. So anytime we're we're just choosing a group of cards, it's going to be combinations. And in our last card question, our condition now is that our five card hand has to contain one or more spades. So remember, spades is a suit of cards. So similar to the previous question, we can have one spade or two spades or three spades or four spades or five spades. This is now my handwritten S to represent spades. If in my hand I have one spade, it also means that I have four cards that are not a spade. If I have two spades, I have three cards that are not a spade. If I have three spades, I have two cards that are not a spade. If I have four spades, one card is not a spade. And if all five cards in my hand are spades, that is my five card hand. You might be thinking now, oh goodness, this is going to be a lot to put into our calculator. And you are correct, but this will work. Now, if you would like a shorter way, you can think about this logically. 
So if our hand has to contain one or more spade, we can have one spade or two spades or three spades or four spades or five spades. The only thing that we will not have is zero spades. If we take all possible hands and remove the cards with no spades, we're going to be left with at least one spade, whether it's one or two or three or four or all five spades. So going back to letter A, the first question we did in this set, all is just any five card hand. So we can say there are are 52 cards in a deck. If we're just choosing any five, this is how many combinations we could potentially have. No spades. If we're removing all of the spades, there are 39 cards in a deck that are not a spade and we are choosing five. So no cards in our hand will have a spade in them. And then by removing those no spade hands, we will be left with the number of combinations that will contain at least one spade in our hand. So you can either do it with direct reasoning where you write out every possible scenario or you can do it using indirect reasoning where you logically think about how can we take everything, remove what we're not using, and that will leave us with the condition that we are asked to find. So this statement, all minus none equals at least one, that's something you're going to want to remember because it can help speed up the process depending on what you're asked. The final thing that we're going to do in this lesson is to solve an algebraic equation involving combinations. So if you see something and it's written in combination notation, the first thing that you want to do is take it out of combination notation and put it into factorial notation. So we know that this represents the number of objects we are arranging. We're going to divide out the ones we're not using, so n minus r, n minus 4. Then we're going to unarrange the objects that we are using, and that's going to equal 35. Then similar to what we did with permutations, we now need to take this out of factorial notation. So I'm going to begin with my n factorial. We're going to go down one, go down one, go down one until you see that factor on the bottom. We know those are going to be cancelling out. So this is going to continue down to three times two times one, but n minus four divided by n minus four is one. Everything in the middle here is going to cancel out, which will leave us with these factors divided by four factorial equal to 35. So the next thing we want to do is remove that 4 factorial from the denominator. I'm going to multiply each side by 4 factorial and then 4 factorial divided by 4 factorial is also 1 on the left hand side. On the right, now remember this is 35 times 4 factorial, so when you put that into your calculator we're going to have 840. We now end up with a degree 4 equation, a quartic equation, and you don't know how to solve those yet. If the resulting equation was either degree 1 or degree 2, you would be expected to continue solving algebraically. But in this case, we're going to have to guess and check. So if we go back to the beginning, one of the first things that we should have done was actually state the restriction. So again, choose your smallest factor, which is this one. No matter what n is, if we subtract 4 from it, this is going to give us a smaller amount. So if I take this factor, we know that n has to be greater than or equal to 0. It's a number of objects we're arranging. It needs to be a natural number. We can have 0 factorial as well. Remember, similar to with permutations. So I know that n has to be greater than or equal to 4. So now because we cannot solve a degree 4 equation at this point, we're going to have to kind of guess and check, but do it logically. So I'm going to begin with what if n is equal to 4? Let's try putting a 4 here. Well, I already know that 4 choose 4 is going to give me 1, so that's not going to work. Let's try 5. That's my next natural number. 5 choose 4 is 5. 6 choose 4 is 15. 7 choose 4 is 35. Ding, ding, ding. That's what we want. We want 35. So we know that n has to be 7, that will make the left side equal the right side. And then what you could do on, in your calculator is go back and actually try 7 choose 4, make sure that you do in fact end up with 35. So if we did not get a quartic equation here, you would be expected to continue algebraically. This is the process you begin with. So take it out of combination notation into factorial notation, take it out of factorial notation, and then from there algebraically try to isolate your variable.